Okay, I think we should start now then. You know the rules, right? So over to you. <laughs> We're all familiar with that experience of phoning into a call center. And when we do so, we start off with navigating through this automated menu system where you have to select many different options by pressing buttons. And we call the system an interactive voice response or IVR for short. Now, the purpose of an IVR is to direct us to the correct department or call center agent to speak to to hopefully resolve our query. Now, at Discovery and specifically Discovery Health, where I'm employed as a data scientist, we receive almost 9 million calls per year and on average 20,000 calls per day from our members alone. And when so many of these members of us call us, it's really imperative that we provide a smooth and efficient IVR and call center journey. And we really want to get them to the right agent at the first, first time of asking. And in this talk, I want to share with you on exactly how we try to achieve this. In this talk, I want to give you some background just on the call flow structures we apply at uh, employ at Discovery Health before describing some of the data analysis we've performed on our IVR and call center data sets. And then I'll describe how we are employing simulation to now inform our redesigns of our IVR systems. And then I'll just share with you what's, what's still in store for us and, and what are we working on in terms of this project. So at Discovery, and specific, specifically Discovery Health, we employ these IVR systems and uh, this dual functionality of either offering self-service functionality. So if you just need to request a membership or tax certificate, then you can do this in the IVR without having to speak to anyone. Or we can ultimately navigate through to the IVR to get transferred to a call center agent. We always require you to verify your identity. So if you do so, then we have your details already on hand. And then we also have different contact numbers for different communities phoning us. So a medical aid scheme member would phone a specific number, a financial advisor would phone a different number. And for each of these different numbers, we have different IVRs or call flows. When it comes to our call center, we've got a call center of about one and a half thousand agents. And all of these agents are then divided into skills, or you can call them pools dedicated to specific query types. So we would have a pool of authorizations agents that are trained to deal with authorization specific queries. So then we have, well, we have many different, different skills or these kind of pools. And the purpose then of the IVR is to direct these members to the correct pools. So I think the need for an efficient IVR is, is quite intuitive, but very specifically to have when we have an emphasis on our member experience, we want this journey to be as smooth and as fast as possible. It's also a great emphasis on reducing operational costs. So if you were to phone through and you speak with one agent and you find out you need to be transferred to a second agent and you have to, have to explain your whole story all over again, that takes a lot of time and results in wasted handling time, which especially in our context, when we operate at such a large scale, it's, it's really, really costly. So you ask about IVRs and you think, is it, is it really still the modern thing to, to phone into something and have this thin voice speaking to you and pressing different buttons? Well, yes, the long-term future of IVR arguably is in what we would call conversational IVR or AI-driven and having it personalized. But whilst that's still somewhat in the future, or at least when the technology is mature enough, in the short term, we said, like, let's have this in-house data analytics solution and see what are the quick quick wins we can gain from just analyzing this data ourselves. So just at a, at a very high level, how would the IVR structure look like? So it's almost, you can think of it as a tree. We've got many different tiers and each of these tiers would represent some, some menu where you exercise an option and you ultimately get routed through to an agent or as I've said, you can do some self-service. Um, functionality, but so this is a high level simple overview, but in reality it looks more something like this, which makes it much more complex to, to really go and analyze and work with when you when you consider all the things that happen in the background that you as a caller would, would not even know about. 
So then a couple of years ago, we actually for the first time ever started to analyze this IVR data and then specifically in connection or in conjunction with the call center data. And when I say call center data, I speak about when you speak to um, agents in certain skills or pools. So we know with whom you spoke to and for how long and so forth. But now we are able to connect you to, well, connect it to the IVR journey itself. And when you've got these data to your disposal, you can ask different questions. So we ask, where in this IVR do our members spend the most time? Are the self-service options easy and intuitive to find? Or we can ask, but which IVR journeys lead to the highest transfer rates on the call center side? And I want to show you some of these insights that we've gained from, from doing this analysis and asking those questions. So just as an example, so we've get this end-to-end -end view on caller journeys for the first time. So just in this, just as an example with this visualization, we call it a Sankey diagram. So we've got different paths in the IVR. So that pink bar would be your main welcome message. And then there's many different paths. This gray bar would present the boundary between IVR and call center side. And ultimately you get through to a final um, skill or pool. And just as illustration here is to say that there are many different paths taken here to the same destination. And that's arguably inefficient and we can try and find out why this would be the case. Another natural thing to measure is what is the time spent in the IVR. So if you've got an average MBR year of our members spent in the IVR over the course of 2020, you can see, um, say in January, starting at almost two minutes, which can argue is relatively long. And then you'll see clearly these spikes here in March and much more evidently in April was when the COVID pandemic hit and we introduced this COVID information message and also towards the end of the year when there's what we call end of year changes. And this really reminds us how um, sensitive this IVR is or if you were to add changes or add menus like really what is the impact of this then on your IVR but in a way it it took us for to actually have this data before we really came to this realization. Naturally, if you've got different menus and options in your IVR, you can now go and measure the utilization of these different options. Like if you have a menu of five options, are these really utilized? So what I want to share with you, share with you here is what we call a main tier two menu. So you can see the many different options. You press different buttons and then it goes down all the way through to you can just sit and wait idle for the first available consultant and you don't actually have to press a button. And when we look at the distribution of these options, so if we've got these options on the vertical axis and the percentage utilization on the horizontal axis, I just want to highlight if we see the small cohort to select press nine for the returning to the previous menu, we think arguably they are looking for something else and clearly they have to listen through this whole menu and not hear what they what they're looking for. So um, we want to try and find out, but but what really is it that they are then looking for? And if we look at the wait for agent option, close to 60%, we just sit through this whole menu uh, before they make their selection. And you have to ask, but there's probably also some very specific option missing for them. And if we find out what it is, maybe we can insert this very explicit or specific option for them. Now, yeah, I want to show you an animation and what this would um, focus on would be where we where, as I've said, we require callers to identify or verify the identity, but we do see a fraction of callers who would fail this identification step. And you'd have to ask, why would someone not be able to correctly enter their, their ideal policy number? And yeah, I'll, I'll show you this animation on people going through the step of failing the identity or verification, but I also want to just illustrate the, the granularity of this data and what value you can really extract from this. So when I start this animation, you will see dots emanating from this start circle over here. And these dots are colored by time spent in the system. So when the dots change from blue to green, you'll see that means it's already 10 seconds spent just on this identification step. And if this is then a sample of callers who fail this identification and verification step, what do we what do we see? Why would this happen? Well, 
there's a fraction of callers who we can see they provide no input at all, which you think is quite bizarre. If we ask for your ID number and they do not press any button. Then we would have a cohort that would provide invalid input. This means we expect, say, a 13-digit input number and they only provide seven digits. That's invalid input. But then for some cohort, we would ask you to enter your date of birth and we think they arguably get the date of birth format wrong. And then you will also fail this step and get rooted to a very specific menu. And then finally, we get those who would seemingly do enter the correct identification number, but then it's most likely linked to an inactive, oops, sorry, inactive membership or inactive slides, uh, inactive membership, which means that it is possibly then just some policy that's been cancelled recently or something, something like that and therefore we don't have your details on hand right now. So just an example, if you've got the data at this level of detail, then it really allows you to, but how can we change or redesign something in this IVR structure to, to prevent these kinds of phenomena occurring? Then another thing that we, we've done is to say, but if we look at the call center data, what do we see on the call center side that's probably unwanted or inefficient? And what can we glean from the IVR journey that can teach us maybe something on the IVR side is going wrong that would lead to this phenomena on the call center side? So what we've done here is I'm looking here at a specific menu, which we call an authorizations menu. So it's at the tier three level, and you can see there are different options related to various authorizations. And what we plot here is the, we can call it transfer rate, but what if you pass through these options, what is the number of agents you've spoken to passing through these various options? So if we've got the different options here on the vertical axis and then the number of agents here on the horizontal axis in terms of just the percentage utilization, I want to draw your attention to the press zero and press two options. So dental related authorizations and then also hospital authorizations, and we know these are by far the most popular options on this menu. Now, very interestingly, as you'll see here, there's a very high transfer rate on the dental related options. So it's just more than half of the callers who pass through this dental related option that would speak with one agent only. So many, many get transferred to a second agent. And if you compare it to something like the press two hospital authorization, you can see it's it's vastly different. So you'd have to think why on earth would, would this be the case? So now if you read with me that very first option or sentence for dental related queries, procedures or authorizations, press zero. When I had a look at this and I realized, well, if members hear the word authorizations, they do not realize it's connected to dental. So they think oh, I've got an authorization query, even if it's a, just a general hospital authorization query, and they would press two, which would take, oh, sorry, and they would press zero, which would take you to essentially the wrong skill. Um, so all we have to do is just change the wording and make sure that that very first option is very explicitly stated as being dental related. And ever since we've seen a significant reduction on the transfer rate on that option, um, yeah, a really huge, huge improvement just after a very basic wording on fusion change. Then just more for, for um, demonstrating that you can also with this IVR data look at, but how long do members spend on a menu? Would they actually listen to all of the options before making a selection or are they sort of impatient? Um, just using the, the same authorizations menu as an example, but if I just plot the distribution of what is the time spent before making a selection? So if we um, look at this graph here, just uh, the frequency on vertical axis and then the time on horizontal axis, and these are then colored by the different options. Um, these vertical red lines would just denote the, the boundaries between the different options in this, we can call it the audio file, but I rather just want to draw your attention to where we can see this large cluster pressing the zero option instead of option two. And what we know from this is that they would already press zero before they even got to pressing two, which just um, almost validates that conjecture that they um, mistake it for a general authorization query, whereas if they would have listened just a little bit further on, they would have probably made the right choice. And if we see something like this green 
cluster over here before the five second mark these are the callers quite clearly familiar with the menu and they would just go on and press press the button without having to to listen to the rest of the menu and then just to highlight that with these kinds of visualizations because it might be more difficult to really take with the data is if we can look at things like looping behavior so you can immediately see members bouncing around between the or bouncing around between the same menus and you want to ask but why would this happen and just seeing this allows you to get to some starting point for saying we see this phenomena at a set of menus so let's go investigate it from there so we've performed all of this data analysis and in a way you can say we've exhausted the possibilities of what we can look at in terms of looking at historical data and what we think would sort of be relatively risk-free changes that we can make already but now we need a method of looking at how do we really redesign an IVR, change menus and options to be able to have a much more efficient journey then for all the members, but without really, well, let's say, having any adverse or unintended consequences. And that's where, where simulation comes in. So we definitely don't want to fiddle with a live system or live IVRs, because that will be costly and could easily confuse members. And if we just think back to what would be an ideal member journey is if you go into the IVR, you make your selections quite easily, get to one agent, one agent only, hopefully, and your query gets resolved. But we know in reality, we see more of the bouncing around between menus, getting to one agent and then having dropping transferred to a different one. And now we want to say, but what kind of IVR structure gets us closer to the left hand side? Um, if this is more what we what we see right now. So how do we redesign an IVR and also test it without impacting our members or, or making costly changes without really knowing what, what the results would be look like? And the answer for us here is to use simulation. So if we use simulation and we can simulate many different designs of IVRs and many different scenarios, and this would allow us to get to a much better design. So this is an active work of progress, work in progress of ours. Um, it's a simulation that we are building ourselves from scratch, so it's nothing commercially available that we're building on or just using. And whilst this is a really big undertaking, we've got some results, and I just want to share the very first test that we've we've done with you. And it relates to a number of callers. So we've got this almost 150,000 callers. We would spend a combined almost 900 hours on a specific menu or the tier two menu, which I've showed previously. And they would just sit and wait idle for an agent. And then we know they have a financial related query. If I say finance, it's like having to do with the payment of their contributions or debit orders or maybe medical savings account balance. And now we ask, but if we would include a specific finance option for them to like go and press before they have to wait for an agent, what would the impact of that be? So just on this menu that we are looking at then is we've got this menu and at the moment we've got the close to 60% to withhold for an agent and of them 40% have this finance related queries. So if we want to insert a finance option, or you can think of now any other use case, like where would we now go and insert an option if we want to do it? Well, if we say with we stick with this particular menu, then you can arguably insert this press four option over here. And what this would mean is you can now go and press four without having to wait for an agent, listen to the menu for say 30 seconds. But if you introduce that, maybe it confuses some members, might have some some other effects. So we can go and simulate this and see what, what is the impact of that. But then also just as an example is to say that another structure is maybe to say we're going to introduce a new kind of layering system and maybe you have shorter menus, but more sub menus. And then each sub menu is shorter, but maybe an overall journey is longer. But nonetheless, so this scenario number one is something that we've tested and I won't go into the details of it over here, but Essentially, now we can simulate, but what is our as e situation without this option? And what would the um, situation be if we do simulate with this finance option? And we can say that in this case, we've seen a really great 
net savings in time spent in the IVR if we do include this option. So in this example, it's more just on the member experience and spending time in the IVR as to opposed to necessarily reducing operational costs for us. But this is just one example and many, many more will sh soon follow. And metrics we will measure time spent in the IVR which would remain a big one. And then also looking at transfer rates, but maybe just at what's the average number of selections someone would have to make under a certain design is something we can look at. So just where, where are we still going from here? Well, in terms of this model, so we will have to do continuous validation of it since it's, it's really such a big and complex thing to do. We are building this as an R package, so we're doing those developments and then, of course, many, many cases of scenario testing and integration with many of the stakeholders would need to happen. So we as a data science team, we built this model, but it's obviously many people we need to connect with to, to make sure that these changes get somewhere in terms of the data analytics. I've shared with you what we've done on the member line or call flow, but we've also looking at the advisor line and then we can also look in the future at the health provider call flow, which is also a big one. And then finally, some of these changes we've already logged, which we get from just the data analysis. So we know that these are risk, relatively risk-free changes we can make. So we've got these logged to be implemented in the coming year. And then for some of these, we still do user experience testing. So we'll do this um, as we go along. And then with the data available, we can still monitor the impact of these changes as we go along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marno, for an interesting talk. Uh, questions from the, yes. Um, we have a couple of minutes. Okay. I might have missed it, Manu, but is there a reason why um, you don't do A-B testing? Um, is it just too risky or? Um, so it's it's costly, um, but also I think that when we want to make relatively wholesale changes, we, we are a bit scared to, I suppose, to roll it out too wide. I mean, I suppose you can do it on a smaller base, but uh, there is sort of this case for wanting the experience on a large scale under um, many different scenarios, and then something like this would make sense, but I mean, those testings would also occur. But I just think for what we sort of want to look for and using the data we do have, that's that's something we want to try. Okay. Yes. Hello, Varni. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if those um, client um, evaluation um, ratings at the end of the call are taken into account during the simulation or um, in terms of the time spent, there could be reasons there, um, or how is that qualitative data used? I see it's not used as a testing metric. Uh, yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting one, and if you'd like to please come to my talk tomorrow and you'll, you'll hear more about that. Um, so specifically on, on this one, it, it, there's not that great a correlation because those surveys we do, well, sorry, so the, the more popular one we do is specifically to do with rating the agent as opposed to your experience in the IVR. So we don't have all that much that would necessarily evaluate that. It's much more anecdotal in, in some sense, um, but it is true that in some cases that would, would filter through and even though we may be not working with those data directly, it's still something we are accounting for over here. Thank you. Uh, question one, can you get the caller ID? Yes. So you're rooting for the identification of the person's account, so beforehand and present present them with options immediately? Um, so it's 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 something that I do think we might have on health providers. I think we have something dynamic, but it's not something we, we've got otherwise at the moment. Okay, uh, then the second one is, uh, have you modeled the change, so the impact of doing a, a front-end change? To the system, so that first that call a menu that that you know you want are you wanting to minimize the overall experience or the individual experience. So you know if, if ninety percent of the people are choosing option five, move that option to question zero, option zero, and move you know the, the orders down down the line. Yeah, so so that's something that we we would explore as in terms of all of those scenarios that we've tested, not really gotten that far yet. The the problem with that not problem, but what you could have is the the human behavior element, which is more difficult to model because we had a similar case and then 
those who are familiar with the menus would just go and press that very first option and then um, you get a whole different problem if people don't really re listen to to it as it was. Um, but we would like to model that. And then uh, the caller experience, do you have you contemplated uh, so having a happier caller experience by giving them menus unclickable or enabling or disabling the menu, the, the button selection if a caller, if a, an agent is not available? So yeah, at least you get the experience that you're actually, you're not waiting, you, you, you know, there's nobody can help you, but you're actually waiting to press a button. Yeah, so at the moment we, I don't think we cater as sort of at that level, but I think it's definitely something we'd like to do. I think it just depends on the technology available to, to do that or the platform you're using. Um, but then we are trying to offer you as many different possible options as well for contacting us. So you can even now get to a point where you can contact us via the app if you've already selected your kind of query. Um, so it doesn't have to be all, only that channel that you need to depend on. And callback, and a, and a callback functionality. Yes. All right, thank you. We have to cut off questions now and give some time to the delegates who want to change venue. Thank you again, Manu. Yeah. Our second speaker is Israel Baker from Stellenbosch uh, University. OK, so over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Chairperson. Um, my talk today will be a game theoretical study of the Sermon on the Mount. And these are the areas that I will be covering in my talk. Humans are relational beings, but are often unsure of how to navigate these relationships as they also tend to yearn for power. This constant inner conflict causes tension between a person's ego and their interpersonal relationships. According to the Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung, the ego was the center of consciousness and of all personal acts of consciousness. Linking pride and ego, narcissistic behavior is an adaptive mechanism aiding in not only protecting the ego, but also inflating it. Humans possess the desire to be dominant, but also the fear of being isolated. Human beings want to experience a sense of belonging and worthiness to fill some void and to make them feel complete. They form relationships based on their need for inclusion, control and affection. The victory seeking ego and self preservation of humans cannot coincide with the relational seeking behavior they undeniably possess. These two goals, namely satisfying the ego and maintaining positive relationships are in conflict. Humans have a desire to follow rules and regulations, assuming it will grant them the reward of relationship and moral victory. Humans also seek guidance when making choices. The human being looks to psychology, philosophy and religion to solve the conflict of achieving victory while maintaining good relationships. Primarily, there are two categories of religions, Abrahamic religions, which include Christianity, Judaism and Islam and Eastern religions such as Buddhism, Hinduism and Sikhism. Christianity is the largest of the world's major religions with an estimate of more than 2 billion followers worldwide. In 1970, the majority of the of the population worldwide, approximately 81 percent, adhered to some religion. There is no doubt that humankind throughout throughout history has sought an entity or concept bigger than themselves to believe in and to worship. The Sermon on the Mount has been one of the most important Christian teachings of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. The Sermon on the Mount is one particular portion in the book of Matthew in the New Testament that has been vigorously assessed by biblical scholars. The sermon has functioned primarily as an instigator for the formation of character. Secondarily, the sermon can contribute to decision making collectively with the whole gospel of Matthew. Some biblical scholars interpreted the sermon as Jesus that has given clear, rational, moral and political rules of conduct. Humans are relational victory seeking religious entities. They are adverse to loneliness and loss and pursue strategies to minimize these. In competitive chaos of trying to ascend hierarchies of egos of ego while seeking relationship, humans search for a set of rules to live by, 
hoping that these rules will operate as guidelines to ensure them both relational gain and ego victory. Can a strategy be found to bring calm to this chaos? Christianity in particular offers the Sermon on the Mount as a peacemaking solution to the conflict that exists, between, that exists between the ego and relationship. This brings me to my research question. Can this strategy be modeled using game theory? And what conclusions about the sustainability and victory can be drawn from pursuing the tenants in the Sermon on the Mount as a strategy? This research project aims to review whether the tenants in the New Testament of the Gospel of Matthew can be successfully molded into the game theoretic framework. Fresh biblical and game theoretical insights on the Sermon on the Mount could yield practical implications for living a peaceful, relational and victorious life. David Sally, a strategist, problem solver and researcher in behavioral game theory, reckoned that sympathy in particular can affect a game and transform the payoffs in a game. Sally showed that sympathy can be a basis for a basis for broader social relations theory, since strategic interdependency and social interaction could be linked. In his research study, Roman theory created a game to analyze romantic relationships between two individuals. Mathematical modeling and specifically game theory was used to implement this game between two people who may have completely opposite personalities but could potentially be a good romantic match. In this study, theory showed that it is possible to construct, quantify, and model strategies in such a way as to generate payoffs and optimal strategies. Theory found that game theory can be used for social and behavioral modeling, where payoffs are not quantitative, but rather qualitative. Matthew Robin, a professor of behavioral economics, developed a model for fairness that explicitly incorporates beliefs applicable to two-person finite strategy games. According to Robin, people like to help those who are helping them and to hurt those who are hurting them. One exception to self-interest was that people may care not only about their own well-being, but also about the well-being of others. This idea in Robin's study is useful for modeling the strategies of the Sermon on the Mount. Stephen Brahms applied mathematical theory of games to the Hebrew Bible and modeled a game from the book of Genesis using a game theoretical approach. Brahms relied on non-cooperative games, game trees and matrix forms of games. He assumed only ordinal preferences where players could rank themselves but not attach numerical values to the outcomes. Each player's payoff was not quantitative but, but ranked by preferences on a scale. Richard Beck suggested that the Christian approach is to be a non-zero-sum cooperative play in the game of life. Unfortunately, the game of life seldom includes cooperation, and it appears that the nice guy always wins the least. Emmanuel Baron discussed a simple game constructed by Blaise Pascal between man and God that showed spiritual rewards are possible to quantify for game theoretical analysis. Ego depletion and prosociality are qualitative elements and are difficult to quantify. Five specific tasks are identified from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. These five tasks are quantified as a function of ego depletion and prosociality by interpreting parallels for the five tasks from literature. As a first attempt to interpret the text, the most prominent and diverse tasks are chosen. Assume that the Sermon on the Mount can be summarized as a call to perform five specific tasks. These five tasks are generosity, trust, judgment, prayer, and forgiveness. In the subgame of trust, the reward strategy describes the action of sharing empathy and information with an opponent. The effect strategy describes the action of not sharing empathy or information with an opponent while the punish strategy describes the action of doubting and withholding empathy and information from the opponent. In the judgment subgame, the reward strategy is the action of accepting an opponent's action and appearance, while the defect strategy um, means simply ignoring an opponent. The punish strategy describes the action of unfairly judging and accusing an opponent's choices and actions. In the subgame of prayer, the reward strategy depicts the action of praying for an opponent to be blessed, while the defect strategy describes the action of disregard, disregarding an opponent in praise. 
the punish strategy represents the action of pronouncing a curse over an opponent. In the forgiveness subgame, the reward strategy marks the action of unconditionally forgiving an opponent. The deflect strategy is the action of conditionally forgiving an opponent's transgressions, while the punish strategy describes the act of condemning an opponent for their wrongdoings. The outcomes for the application of each of these five tasks are represented by a three by three matrix. The five tasks are quantified by populating each matrix with entries according to Dreber's four to one punishment technology. Dreber performed repeated prisoner's dilemma experiments on 104 subjects. In each round of a repeated game, participants chose between cooperation, defection and punishment. Dreber showed that the inclusion of costly punishment in the possible payoffs increased participants' proclivity towards cooperation. Costly punishment meant one player paid a cost for another player to incur a cost. Dreber selected cooperation to mean that one player paid one unit of cost for the other player to receive two units of reward. Defection meant one player gained one unit of reward at a cost of one unit of loss for the other player. Punishment meant that one player paid one unit of cost for the other player to incur four units of cost. Similar to Dreber's study, players in the game of the Sermon on the Mount also have the choice of rewarding, defection or punishment towards other people or players. Dreber's quantification method was used to quantify and populate the matrices of the five tasks. Dreber's payoff values were used to associate the cost values with ego depletion and the reward values with prosociality. This quantification method informs the two player non zero sum game theoretical initial matrices for the game of the Sermon on the Mount. Self control is a finite resource that determines a person's capacity to have effortful control over dominant responses. Once this resource is expended or depleted, the state of ego depletion is reached. Ego depletion is also known as impaired self-control task performance. Hage et al. performed a meta-analysis of 83 studies on the effect of ego depletion on task performance and the outcomes related to the tasks. The study consisted of a literature search to identify 83 experimental studies according to an inclusion criteria with 198 independent tests of the ego depletion effect. According to, Bau to Baumeister et al, tasks requiring self-control could be categorized into domains or spheres. These spheres of ego deple depleting tasks were used to determine the correlation of each of the five tasks identified from the Sermon on the Mount to ego depletion. The correlation of the tasks to ego depletion is used to determine the scaling of the tasks against each other. The ego depletion matrices for each task are scaled on trust since trust has the highest correlation to ego depletion. Scaling on trust with respect to ego depletion requires that the initial matrix quantified by Dreber be manipulated. The other four tasks are then scaled on trust by their, effect, by their respective correlation values to ego depletion. For example, um, generosity is about two thirds as positively correlated with ego depletion as trust. So in layman's term, your ego is less exhausted by being generous than trusting an opponent. Pro-social behaviors are voluntarily and, des and desirable actions performed to benefit others, such as helping, sharing, and consoling. Pro-social behavior may improve attitude towards other people, reduce prejudice, and produce positive and inclusive social interactions. The prosociality scale was designed as a measure to assess individual differences to behave prosocially in a global tendency. Carnegie et al. investigated properties of the prosociality scale and its validity across different cultures. They investigated the measure to which the prosociality scale across five different countries can be generalized, namely China, Chile, Italy, Spain, and the US. Items of the prosociality scale were sectioned into prosocial actions and prosocial feelings, which were, which were measured according to the general prosocial factor. From these items of the prosociality scale, parallels were identified and mapped to the five tasks found in the Sermon on the Mount. 
the pro-social actions and pro-social feelings were used to determine the correlation between the five tours and the pro-sociality. The correlation to pro-sociality for each TORS was calculated as the average correlation of the data obtained from China, Chile, Italy, Spain and the US. The items that are closest related to the five TORS are identified from the Sermon on the Mount um, and are chosen from the list of Canigri. The correlation of the TORS to pro-sociality is used to determine the values of the gain matrices by scaling the TORS accordingly. The prosociality matrices for each task are scaled on trust. Since trust is the same task used to scale on for ego depletion, scaling on trust with respect to prosociality means that the initial matrix quantified by Dreber is used to scale the other tasks. The remaining four tasks are then scaled on trust with their respective correlations to prosociality. The scaled values are calculated as a ratio of the respective correlations to the correlation of trust to prosociality. Generosity is 1.04 times more positively correlated with prosociality than trust. In layman's terms, being generous contributes more to a relationship than being trusting. After constructing the two player non zero sum games for both ego depletion and prosociality, the total payoff for each task is calculated as the summation of the entry in the ego depletion matrix for the specific task and the prosociality entry. The resultant net gain or loss for each strategy in the each task game is listed. The Nash equilibrium is calculated for each game to determine the best strategy for each player. The Nash equilibrium is each player's best response to the other player's strategy in the game. Solving the non-zero sum two persons game with the Nash equilibrium shows the best strategy for both players is to defect for all five tasks in the game of living according to the Sermon on the Mount, quantified according to the loss of ego depletion and the gain of relationship. The analytical hierarchy process is a multi-criteria decision-making approach. The factors of interest are arranged in a hierarchical structure. The AHP was used to determine the best combined strategy for the five tasks as a single solution to how to best play the game of the Sermon on the Mount. The expected values of the payoffs to the row player and the column player are modeled by means of the AHP. The entries for the pairwise comparison matrix are determined using the ranking of Van Odenwerf and et al. for the five tasks where the comparison of virtues across 14 nations were reported in their study. Participants mentioned which of the 15 listed virtues were most important to them to practice daily. The sample included religious and non-religious participants. Generosity, trust, judgment, prayer and forgiveness have cultural important weights of 0 0.23, 0 0.18, 0 0.26, 0 0.17 and 0 0.16 respectively. The total expected payoff value of minus 0.37 depicts the loss of living according to the Sermon on the Mount, which reflects the required self-sacrifice to live such a life. When the game of the Sermon on the Mount is quantified by means of Dreber, Hager, Baumeister and Canigri, the best strategy is to defect on all five tours. Even if the best strategy is chosen, the player still experiences an expected loss of minus 0.37. In layman's term, the player can defect to protect himself, but still walks away with the loss. Even if the best strategy is chosen, the player still experiences an expected loss of the value of minus 0.37. A layman's intuition to live a life according to the Sermon on, a mount, on the Mount is a costly life of self-sacrifice. Yet, millions of people across multiple generations have chosen to live this life. The question arises as to how much more additional gain is required to change the best strategy from defecting to rewarding. A sensitivity analysis is performed to determine the pro-social gain a player should receive to consider the reward strategies in the game of the Sermon on the Mount. The analysis is done to determine how much more additional gain is required to change the best strategy from defecting to rewarding. The prosociality matrices of all five games are adjusted such that the total payoff matrices result in the best strategy to be the reward strategy for both players in each subgame. 
the prosociality matrices for the task of generosity, judgment, prayer, trust, and forgiveness require a reward value almost double, approximately 1.6 times the initial um, reward value for the role player. The prosociality matrix for the task of trust requires exactly double the initial reward value for the role player. These increases in the, in the pro-social gain for the reward strategy results in the Nash equilibrium for the total matrices to be the, re the reward strategy for both players. Theologically, these additional gains could be a proxy for measure of faith. A player therefore requires more faith in additional gain to play the reward strategy in the game of trust than to, the replay, than to um, play the reward strategy in other games. However, all games require at least some measure of faith in additional gain to entice the player to choose to reward their opponent. The pure strategy for both players is then to reward the opponent in all five tasks. The adjusted total expected value of rewarding an opponent in all five games is calculated as 3.85 for both the row player and the column player. This expected value is calculated by assigning the cultural important weights determined as previously by the AHP. Yet millions of people throughout the ages across multiple generations have been living according to the Sermon on the Mount. Perhaps a metaphysical reward makes it worth playing the game of the Sermon on the Mount. There exists conflict between the human desire to be victorious, socially accepted and morally good. Different texts present different strategies for best achieving these three goals. The Christian tenets specifically set out in the Sermon on the Mount present strategies that appear to be in conflict with the desire to achieve traditional victory to satisfy the pride of ego. Intuitively, these tenets might seem upside down and questionable, but these counter instinctual strategies can lead to a sustainable game and even victory for the player if a measure of faith is applied. If the different games are played without faith and without prior knowledge of the opponent's approach to life based on these three possible strategies, it is not profitable to live according to the Sermon on the Mount. Even without a measure of faith, it is unfavorable to punish, but to reward when an opponent is actively punishing is very painful. If the different games are played with a measure of faith and without prior knowledge, of an opponent's approach to life. Rewarding the opponent is even sweeter, and the player is able to obtain at least some gain from rewarding, even when the opponent continues to punish. When quantified as proposed in this research, the best strategy to protect the player's ego and remain social is to defect from the tenants of the sermon, but even in defection, the player still suffers a loss. A measure of faith increases gain so that the best strategy becomes to live according to the sermon, and even in self-denial, a greater gain is achieved. The best strategy for each player without faith in a metaphysical reward is to defect, but with faith in a measure of additional payoff, it becomes lucrative to play the reward strategy on the various tasks. The question arises whether the best ones of strategy remain such in repeated interactions with players of various life approaches. Simulation of repeated games pitting players on the faith-induced increased payoff matrix against opponents either on the same increased payoff or the original payoff values. When, if ever, does playing according to the Sermon on the Mount induce an intolerable loss? How sustainable are the strategies according to the Sermon on the Mount in the context of a benign or an antagonistic opponent? Various repeated interactions may be simulated to determine the total payoff and the expected payoff of all five different games, namely trust, generosity, judgment, prayer and forgiveness. Thank you, Esra. Now we still have some time for quick questions. Yes. Could you please repeat the question? <laughs> So do you see the Sermon on the Mount as a gain for the church because both players are constantly losing? 
<laughs> um, I did this in the sense of neutral players, not assuming they're religious, if they're religious or non-religious, but I think it could be, yeah. Yeah, I think it could be potentially be, yeah. I'm not saying religious, just as in like as, as a as a preaching system where where like religious religion becomes on a, a system where where the players lose but the, the the controlling body wins as a gameplay so so it's not just between two players but it's an external body as well so there's a loss we've demonstrated that there's a generally a loss according to those preachings so where is that loss going to oh yeah that would be something interesting to look into yes where is that loss going yeah <laughs> Yes, one last question. If okay, no more questions. So thank you. It's fine, Thank Alec. you. The last talk, please. <laughs> we can. <laughs> okay, so the last speaker of the day. Famous Rob, um, yeah, over to you. Okay, um, all right, so uh, I stand between you and a social mixer, um, which is not a position I want to be in, but I'm here. I didn't do the program, where's the, he's in the other room. Okay, so you can blame him for this. Um, this talk, unfortunately, um, I, I did it, um, and in the interest of completeness, I couldn't leave anything out. And then I saw where I was in the program, and I was like, yes, gonna hold everyone hostage. So let's start, um, everyone raise a hand. Um, yeah, yeah, let's let's see that. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Excellent. You're all here. We're going to be using these hands in a moment. So I'm checking everyone's arms are working and um, we know that it functions. Let's begin. So I'm sure everyone's read the slide. No need for me to read it out. Let's begin. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of a particular problem that we attacked, how we solved it, what we did. Um, and my biggest gripe with this entire discipline, and it really is computational geometry, is the lack of solid definitions and an understanding of what's actually going on, right? So I'm going to try and relay that some of, uh, some of that to you so that if you ever find yourself in a position, you'll go, oh yeah, I remember Rob spoke about that once upon a time, I should definitely watch out for insert label here, okay? So uh, we're not gonna unfortunately have a lot of time to chat about precision. I really wanted to chat about GMP and MFR. Um, if you wanna know more about how to do um, arbitrary precision on a computer, come chat to me in a lunch break. It's, it's really cool. Um, we're gonna talk about a decomposition. We're gonna throw it all together and we're gonna look at some examples. What's that? Switch the mic. Is it? All right, so uh, let's do it. So some quick terminology, I'm going to fly through this literally. So uh, we have a geometry, it's a well-defined shape. Um, it's not allowed to be null, empty, it, it must exist. It must have some sort of numerical definition to it. Uh, collection, just a collection of shapes, that's fine. And generally of the same type, that's the best way to organize things. Uh, we've got a point, n-dimensional, typically x, y, z, especially if you're working on the potato that is planet Earth. But uh, normally uh, x, y is also fine. Could also be one-dimensional, not so interesting though. Okay, and we've got an edge defined by two points. We've got a start and an end, not necessarily directed. We're happy with just an edge uh, and a line string. So a line string is defined. It's a sequence of points and you've got N minus one edges between those points and that forms a line string. I'm gonna show you a picture now, don't worry. So what about a polygon? A polygon, you can think of it just like a line string, except it's closed. So that last edge, we link it back to the beginning and we get a closed form shape, right? So uh, this is kind of what you can think of it. We've got the same set of points. Points on the left, a single edge between two points, a line string, it's open at the end. And if we just close that last edge, ah, we have a polygon, right? So uh, let's begin with the question time. We know your arms are working. Who thinks this is a simple polygon? Okay, I got two hands. Yeah, okay, it's, uh, yeah. This is a simple polygon. Uh, who thinks this is a simple polygon? <laughs> yes, there we go. Who thinks this is a simple polygon? Okay, one, yeah, great. Okay, so this is not simple. Um, sorry. <laughs> And I, I tricked you there, um, but the catch is this little piece in the middle. Um, and uh, so you're gonna be asking yourself, what makes it simple? So I'm gonna draw some directed arrows here to help you give a, a sort of intuition. So we all said this one was simple. Well, let's assume we all said it was simple. Um, and if you walk the polygon, so position yourself at the top and walk down the polygon, you'll notice as you walk this line and you follow the polygon around, the polygon, the interior of the polygon, the bit that's shaded is always on your left, right? And the bit that's on the outside is always on your right. Okay, so let's look at this. If I walk here, I start out the polygons on my left, and as I traverse this edge, half of the polygon is on my left, and then the other half is on my right. And as I go down, it's on my right, and then as I come up, it's on my right, and then it's on my left. 
And so the switching of the sides suggests that you have two edges that are crossing one another, right? And you're not allowed to have a crossing edge. So you'll say, Rob, don't worry, we can fix this. We'll just throw a point in the middle. Okay, so now we're kind of cheating, right? So we put a point in the middle, it's on my left, it's on my left. Okay, but now where are we going to from here? So there's two ways you can interpret this diagram because it's a bit ambiguous because you don't know how the edges are connected in the flow. But you could say I'm stepping there and then I'm stepping over and then down and through. And there's a catch. There's another rule here. You're not allowed to have two points that are identical in the same polygon definition. Okay. So this sounds like a little bit arbitrary, but, but what we can do is treat it as two polygons, right? So one on the left where we cycle this way and the polygon interior is always on our left and one over here where we cycle again in any arbitrary direction, but the side of the polygon is always the same. And they can share that exact point in the middle because um, they're actually in two separate polygon definitions. So you can think of this as yeah, two separate polygons that have the same point exactly, but they're in separate definitions. So this is okay, right? We can work with this. Um, all right, so uh, no duplicate points, uh, no crossing lines or parallel edges, and the parallel edges is a tricky one. Um, obviously, uh, you can have parallel edges, but they can't be exactly on top of each other because that would allow you to loop through something into somewhere else, so that's cheating. Um, and you must have a consistent interior side, right? So that's generally the most common um, sort of definition. So we can all agree this one's simple. Um, is this simple? Hands up, who thinks it's simple? I'm the only one. Oh, can't you? He agrees. This is a simple polygon. Um, there's nothing wrong with this definition, um, but uh, you're all very um, uh, cautious now because you know that there's something coming. Um, is that simple? So if we move the hole to the top left. Ah, okay, we're all on the same page now. There's the catch. So that one is not simple. And the reason is, again, is uh, there's a rule here that says you can't have an interior hole that crosses the exterior ring. Right. The moment you do that, again, it's not a simple polygon. This is a complex definition, so that's not allowed. Okay. So uh, my personal preference, um, work with collections of polygons, multi-polygons, that's fine. Decompose them into simple polygons where you can. Um, individual polygons consist of contours. They've got rings that can only have one primary ring, so you have one primary um, definition. And then from there, you can define contours, which are effectively the holes. And each contour must be a, itself a simple polygon and can contain simple polygons itself. And so we go all the way down the rabbit hole. And if your contours don't intersect, they can have duplicate points. You have a simple polygon, right? Um, and everything should be within the primary ring. So you're going to say, Rob, this is useless. This is a massive waste of time. Why are you doing this to us? Uh, this is awful. We want to go home. Oh, no, we want to go drinking. Um, does this happen in the real world? Can anyone think of an example? And I'll give you a hint, close to home. Um, yeah, South Africa has a ginormous hole in it in the definition, right? Uh, we're one of two countries that completely landlock another country. And so understanding how to work with holes from time to time can be quite useful, especially if you're dealing with big polygon definitions. And this is a multi-polygon because there's a whole bunch of islands down here which are actually defined as separate entities in the polygon definition because they're not connected to anything else. They can exist as their own polygon, that's fine. But that hole exists inside the big polygon. And uh, some country definitions also have their holes defined for like really big land ma uh, water masses, like in Canada. But we'll get to that. So let's talk about point in polygon. Point in polygon is exactly what you think it is. It tests whether a point is in a polygon, right? So two input arguments, a point and a polygon. And it says yay or nay, true or false. Okay, so that's quite easy. So we can put three points in this diagram. It's not a trick. Uh, the red ones say it's not in the polygon. The green one says it's in the polygon. Right. So again, very simple algorithm. Uh, well, it's not simple, uh, but it's uh, gloriously quick. Uh, you can do a point in polygon in n log n time for an arbitrary polygon definition. Um, so if you've got 10 points, call it 23 operations. This is quite cheap. Um, we don't mind doing this operation so much. Um, so why do we need to make it faster? Um, so let me give you a quick motivation. Who knows what this picture is? Andre's got his hand up, but Andre is sneaky. So let's see, Stefan. Yes, so this is the world's internet infrastructure that connects all of the data centers around the world in the specific port landing locations, right, and how those network cables travel around the world. So um, if you're like us and you've got some global infrastructure and you're trying to connect to customers that are all around the world, um, all of a sudden you have to worry about where these cables are and how things connect, right? So uh, as an example, if you want to get from Australia to Ireland, um, you're looking at about uh, of one and a half seconds worth of latency one way, right? So that's a problem. So maybe you want to localize a server somewhere and you want to make sure that you can minimize the request time to that server. But then you have to say, well, can I solve this thing in this particular place, right? So that's kind of the, the high level requirement. So we solve a, a lot of VRPs, a couple of thousand every day, and we run this distributed architecture. And so what we can do is when 
these requests come in from these different continents, we can look inside the payloads and say, can I run this request on this particular data center or do I need to send it somewhere else where the data might be for that particular request, right? And that allows us to basically speed up um, the rate at which we can do things and also saves us quite a bit of money. So we, we run a lot of map servers and they take up a lot of memory. So if we can shard these things out and localize them to where they need to be, that's fantastic, right? So um, I say compute is expensive, latency is unacceptable. Um, I'd love to solve this problem with money, but I guess latency comes at a price. So let's see if we can be smart about it, right? So that's what we're trying to do here. Um, but we need to do it fast, right? Um, and really, really fast because uh, you'll see why now. So uh, we, we normally have about 10,000 points on WGS84. WGS84 is the standard longitude and latitude uh, coordinate reference system that everyone uses predominantly. It stands for the World Geodesic System. And guess what year it was defined in? 1984. Go figure. Um, so for a particular payload that comes through to us, so we've got a VRP with a thousand points in it, we have to answer the question, what country do they fall in, right? So for each point, we have to run a point in polygon. We have to say, well, against all the countries in the world, which polygon does this fall in, right? And this can be a little bit of an onerous um, um, uh, request uh, or query to run. So for M uh, input map uh, points, and you've got N map points approximately defining the polygons, um, if we just have one point, you're looking at about three and a half seconds, right, per point. Right? So all of a sudden, if you've got a thousand points, this is very, very computationally expensive. And it's because of the richness of the um, polygon definitions. So you could say, well, uh, we can reduce the size of N. Maybe we make the polygon simpler somehow, right? How do we do that? Guaranteeing that we never tell someone they're in a country that they're not, right? Um, so that's, uh, yeah, we definitely want to do it. We don't want to get the answer wrong. We could use uh, something like a spatial index, uh, could use an R tree, we'll discuss that quickly. Or maybe we can find some sort of middle ground, we can compromise in some way, right? Uh, so this is where we get sneaky. So let's talk about the, the data. Uh, publicly available, it's the GADM, uh, it's the Global Administrative Boundaries version 36, available in whatever format uh, floats your boat. Uh, it's about two gigabytes um, compressed. Uh, 256 country definitions, there obviously aren't 256 countries, but that's the, the definitions that they're using for the administrative boundaries. Um, because it turns out we're still fighting over country borders, so these things change. Um, so this is a, a nightmare you don't want to be involved in keeping up to date with this. Um, we've got multi-polygons, they've got holes, but they're not all simple. Okay, so this is a problem for us because we've got almost 33 million points defining these polygons, but not all of those polygons are simple, so this is a problem. Okay, so... Um, let me give you an example. Uh, Canada, uh, this is Canada, uh, and Canada has roughly 25,000 individual polygon definitions in that file. And this is what creates a lot of complexity if you're just trying to answer the question of, am I in Canada or the USA? And uh, yeah, this is tough, right? And part of it is, if you look along the coastal regions here, you'll see an incredible amount of texture, right? And that's because these boundary lines are very well defined and very well maintained. Um, and this makes it difficult for us. Okay. So, um, you could do line thinning, right? Line thinning is a super easy trick to do. You take your polygon and you just reduce its complexity a bit. So, you, let's say if this is our line over here, you find the maximum angle between two points. So, uh, if you look between these two points, these two line segments form almost 180 degrees. So, you look at this line and you say, cool, we can take those, um, this point out over here, see? And we'll put a line in over there. But the problem with this is that we could give the wrong answer, right? So let's say if I had Canada on that side and the US on this side, by taking out that point, if I had a request point come in, in between the two, let me use the pointer, so over there, right? Um, before I would have said it was in the US and after that adjustment, I'd say it's in Canada. Okay, so now we've given a, uh, a false positive um, and that's bad, so that's out. Um, we can use an R tree, we can index the data. So maybe we can find which polygons we're close to really quickly um, and uh, our trees have got really incredible uh, uh, query performance time, pretty reasonable space complexity. That's that's okay. And this is kind of a visualization of how it creates an index. And so what you can do is you can run a closest query, right? So you could say, well, here's the point. I know where this point is. Find me all the points that are close to this within some sort of radius, right? So we don't know the radius up front, but that's okay. This request is so fast, you can just say, well, take the radius and make it progressively bigger until I've checked at least some sort of number of points so I can be at least reasonably confident, right? The problem with this is that I could have a weird definition where I've got a line that spans this and a couple of definitions close by, maybe on an island, and I think I've checked enough points, but I haven't, right? So all of a sudden, we're back into the territory of we could be giving the wrong answer. So, um, yeah, the archery, 
you would basically, you can get a response from the artery in about 17 operations, which is super cheap for a computer. Uh, and then you run a point in poly for each of the unique polygons associated with that. That's an order one check. Um, so that's okay. The problem is, is your artery takes about eight gigs of space for this particular data set. And that's quite onerous as well, because now we've got to run three of these around the world so that we can just say, well, where are we, right? So this is a problem. So what can we do? So I started writing out this algorithm, um, and I thought I'd start with the picture. I don't know if anyone played uh, a game that looked something like this when they were kids. Yeah. Hunter did. Um, I think it, uh, when I was growing up, it was called Gal's Panic, but I'm not proud of it. Um, it's, yeah, uh, I, I had a, a neglected youth. My parents left me alone way too much. Um, so uh, yeah, this game is basically you fight for space. So uh, your opponent uh, that you're playing against on an arcade machine is up here and you're down here and you walk around and you try and draw lines here to take up space in the box. And there's a, a boss that's moving around trying to, trying to break you. And if you get caught before you've closed the loop, before you've closed the line, you lose, right? Uh, and so this is a fantastic game. So I, I thought um, rectangles, right? This is, I woke up one morning, I was like, we need rectangles um, because uh, rectangles, as it turns out, if you want to run a point in poly against a rectangle, it's an order one operation. Uh, you can tell immediately if a point is in a, in a rectangle, if you know it's a rectangle. Um, because all you're checking is, am I horizontally inside and am I vertically within these two boundaries? And all of a sudden, you know exactly whether you're in a rectangle. I know this sounds silly, but go with me. Okay. So uh, rectangles, you can index as segments, right? Which means you don't need a fancy R tree. You can get away with something called an interval tree. Uh, and this is like, in my mind, one of the best kept secrets of uh, sort of this kind of geospatial indexing. Um, it has almost the same properties exactly as a R tree, except you have rectangles, so you have an order one point in poly time at the end. So is there an algorithm to find an optimal number of rectangles? Hands up. Yep, Fani thinks so. Fani is right. Uh, and it's uh, uh, N to the four, right? Uh, and it can be done. But it's super complicated, and it doesn't work with complex polygons. So uh, that's off the table, um, and doesn't work with holes. So it's a, it's a fantastic algorithm, but it's it's really tricky to actually implement and get working on this particular kind of data. So what do we do? So um, this is what we came up with, and this is a, a dirty approximation of the truth. Uh, no, it's not. It's a, it's a it's a dirty way of solving it, but it works really really well. So we're going to have a stochastic algorithm that we're going to run many 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 times, as much time as we feel like spending on this problem, but um, so we don't have a proof that this is an optimal way of doing it, but we get really, really close, right? So um, I was going to write out the algorithm, and I thought pictures would be better. I start at the red point. We're going to pick a point randomly within this polygon, right? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to draw a vertical line. And we're going to say, okay, along this vertical line, where does this intersect the polygon underneath it, right? Uh, and you'll see, oh, it's these two points over here. We say, fantastic, we've got a vertical boundary. Let's create some horizontal boundaries, right? So we cut across, and we look at those horizontal boundaries, and you say, well, where do those intersect the polygon? We say, oh, those two points over there. Well, let's close the loop. So let's connect it all up, uh, and we have a square, a rectangle. Let's go with that. It's a rectangle. Um, and then what we do is we say, well, that's fantastic. We've now found a rectangle based on a random starting point. Let's cut this out. So what we do is we cut out the interior of that uh, polygon because we know it touches all of those edges because we've drawn the lines. We know the exact points of intersection at whatever precision we're working with, separate conversation, and we create four new um, vertices along that polygon. But what we've actually done, because of the way we've cut this polygon, we know we can do something else. We can now break this up into, button. Okay, that was supposed to sequence out elegantly. I was supposed to go one, two, three, four. It's not happening. Um, we can cut this out into four uh, completely separate polygons that we know don't overlap because of the way we've cut the problem. And now we can recurse. So we've actually broken this up into a recursive problem. We now, for each of these, if this, if they were more complex than this, we could now recurse down and proceed to chop them up and try and find a place to cut those polygons as well, right? So this is surprisingly neat. Um, yeah, I'm just going to be patient for the button now. Uh, so what we do is we randomly search, and our criteria here is to maximize the area of the rectangles that we find. So that's our criteria. So we we pluck a bunch of random points in there, and we're going to try this many, many times, and we're going to just keep track of whichever one was best, right? We avoid creating poly uh, complex polygons. We don't want to do that. And once we've split the polygon up, we can recurse into the resulting polygons that that creates. And our stopping criteria is either there are very few vertices in the polygon. Uh, it would be too much effort to bother indexing something too simple. Or 
uh, we can't find a valid decomposition or the area is really, really tiny. So this is kind of like we've gotten to a level of resolution in the data that we're probably never going to care about. OK. So what does the result look like? Wait for the. Huh. OK, that's not. There we go. OK, so we wait about eight hours on eight threads. Um, sometimes you have to multi thread. Um, it's about 60 hours of work to decompose that big file. Uh, and we end up with a picture, hopefully, together now. <laughs> I didn't think my presentation was that onerous on this hardware, but let's see. Oh, there we go. Uh, it's still rendering. No, no, go back. It's registering all the clicks. Um, this is deeply disappointing, given how long it took me to put all of this together. But yeah, let me. Uh, so, OK, uh, let's not go too far. I'm going to stop pushing the button. Uh, OK, uh, this is a really nice way of looking at it. So you can see how what's happened is, is it's picked these arbitrary points to cut these polygons up and you've got these really big squares. But what you can see is between countries that you've got the boundary line that's being maintained, right? So you've kind of got very rough resolution around the edges, um, and we'll dive into that in a second. But like if you look at South America or the center of the US, so think now if any point lands in that rectangle, right, in the US, and that's a massive portion of the area of the US, um, we're looking at a log n time on the seg tree to get a lookup and an order one on that rectangle. That is like 90% of the US is now almost immediate for us to tell that you're in it, right? Um, which is very, very powerful. And we haven't lost any resolution on the boundaries, as I'm going to show you now. Um, so if you look at South Africa, uh, this is the breakdown of the polygons here. Pretty reasonable. Could probably be better. We could maybe do some merging. We could do some changing, but that's not, it's not too bad. Um, importantly, our little hole that is Lesotho um, is still nicely defined. Uh, we actually run a particular map set for a particular person that likes to treat Lesotho very differently to everywhere else. Understandable. Um, and if you bring in the other countries, you can see how those decompositions, um, how they interact near the boundaries between the countries, right? So this is pretty cool in my mind. Let's see. Next slide. Ah, yes. Fantastic question. So, um, and this is where my final table will make a lot of sense. Let's try this one more time. Uh, so this is the border with Lesotho. So what I wanted to do here was just uh, zoom right in so that you can see this is very much recursive. As you go into the borders, it just looks more like the same, like what it did at the top level, which is great because it means we didn't make a mistake when we coded this algorithm up. So this is why we don't care about uh, board, um, the ocean, right? So if you were to run this uh, problem, so the first column here is if you're just running very straightforward, are we on time? Are we out of time? Okay, we almost, this is the last slide, luckily, somehow we made it. Um, the, on the original problem, uh, if you were to run, let's say, uh, 10, oh, let's pick a decent number, 10,000 points, we're looking at about 35,000 seconds, right? And so what's interesting here is the stats at the top. So uh, it's about, so call it 2.6 2 gigs in memory, 256 layers, X number of polygons. If we add an interval tree around those polygons instead of an R tree, just it's a little bit lighter weight, um, same number of polygons, much more in memory. So that's the cost of the index, right? So that's the cost of creating that lookup. But you can see our time comes right down, right? So you're sort of dropping a few orders of magnitude down to four and a half seconds to do 10,000 points. Um, and it's still exact. That's just using a lot of point in polygon, that n log n algorithm at the bottom, right? But if you decompose the polygons, you can see our number of polygons over here explodes, right? We've got four million polygons that all of a sudden we're running, right? So our memory consumption goes up to like 10 and a half gigs, um, but our query time comes right down. And so it's very attractive, but the problem is, is that we've kept all the resolution from the original problem. So I didn't tell you, but in the diagrams that I showed you now, <clears throat> what we actually did was we looked at the borders, um, so the boundaries of the coastline, where there is no interaction with another country, right? So I might mistake the ocean, right, for the country that it's closest to, but I'll never tell you that you're in a country that you're not, right? Um, and so we don't mind this so much because sometimes people get their data wrong. So if you're really, if you're off the coast of Somalia by a significant margin, we can then actually give you a warning and say, oh, you, do you realize you're in the Atlantic Ocean? Um, uh, and, oh, no, we do. We actually have a sea pirate response. Um, zero, zero is a particularly common geocode that gets sent to people. Um, and then we tell them, uh, you're probably not off the coast of Nigeria hunting for something. So, uh, yeah, we try to be a little bit comical where we can. Um, but if you start to union all the coasts, so if you remember that Canada example, a lot of granularity around the coastline. You can kind of merge all of that out into a grid, 
And you can see there's like a 10x reduction in the number of polygons. So here you can see I've said this is not exact anymore. You, we permit false positives, but a particular kind of false positive that is actually acceptable, right? Um, and now you can see the real impact of this. So, I mean, I didn't even bother running the other algorithms for a million points, but we can do a million points in only, so 10x more points in only three times more time with significantly less memory. So the in-memory component of this is about 400 megabytes altogether, which is not very attractive because you can run it on a micro server on an edge somewhere and you don't have to pay a fortune for it. So um, that's the end. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, it sounds, yeah. We still have, yeah, we can take some questions if there are. <laughs> So um, the first uh, rectangle that you place in each country you demonstrated um, by placing the point, or how, how does that first the first rectangle come about when you place it in each um, location? Yeah, so um, you're thinking of like this first rectangle here, right? Yeah, do you use that method for the for each country, or is it a different? Correct. Yeah. So each each um, within each country, you take all of its polygons and you apply this to each individual polygon. So you're not changing the definition of uh, the layer. Um, they're all still. So let's say, for example, this was South Africa. South Africa's got eight polygons, right? Um, and so for each polygon, you would apply this algorithm to each individual polygon. And some of them are big, and some of them are tiny islands. That's okay. We don't mind. Um, but the process of how you find this first square is a lot of search. So you'll run the algorithm like, you know, 100 times to try and find a good representative point because once you decompose it, you're not going back. So kind of think of it like as a, like a, as a, as a search tree. Once you make this first cut on this first step over here, you're going to be applying it to all of the pieces around here, right? And so you want to make sure that you every time you get as much space as you can before you recurse down. Hmm. I don't know if that was your question, but okay. Question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you're quite right. The The key thing about this algorithm is that it's incredibly cheap to run. Um, so uh, the, the reason I keep harping back to the original size of the data, I don't know if you've ever tried to do something past order n cubed, um, it gets really hair raising. And as much as I want to spend two years invested in a problem that's probably going to come out approximately at the same um, index value, sure, it might be 10% better, but we've, we've done such a good job just by slicing it up like this that it, it's almost... Oh, why don't I bother maximizing it? Oh. oh, because it's operations research. If I miss the opportunity to maximize something, I'm I'm going straight to to hell. I mean, it's maybe one last question. Is there? Thank you, Rob. Um, maybe just if you didn't come this method or like what what would the alternative be or maybe what do you think you would have woken up differently with so um this is confession time how 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 long do you think i spent on this because i looked at a lot of polygons and got very angry um, and when you when you have to interrogate this big data file and pick out a polygon that for some reason was not defined as a simple polygon and all your algorithms are failing um, I'd, I'd gone too far, Manu. There was no other option. Um, uh, you, I, I don't know how else you practically solve this problem with, with the kind of requirements that we required from the, the query side of things. I, I don't know how else you would have done it without incurring like a huge computational cost. But I, realistically, I probably spent a month on this, um, which it's a lot of time, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So this this completely supports. So this this diagram here is super simple, but the point in poly query um, is actually very clever for uh, holes, um, and it, it it's kind of obvious when you see it. Um, and I'm sorry, everyone, that I'm carrying on like this, but uh, uh, let's just go all the way back to our whole definition. <laughs> Sorry, 
kind of bang, LaTeX. Yeah, so here, um, what you actually do, um, you, you run the point in polygon. Um, it's super simple. Ignore the hole, right? So let's take the red point in the middle. If you ignore the hole and you pretend like it was a whole, um, uh, a W-H-O-L-E polygon, right? If you run the point in polygon there, it'll say true, right? So it'll say it's in the polygon. But then what you do is you run the point in polygon against the hole. And if that comes back true, you invert the, the top tier response. So that way you can actually make it valid. You can recurse all the way down, have polygons and polygons and polygons, which doesn't happen in map data, but it can happen theoretically. And all that happens is every time you hit a point in poly, you invert whatever result you had before. Um, and that way it's valid for, for all polygons with holes. Hmm. 